In October 2001, just a few weeks after the bioterrorist attacks of 9-11, the United States was hit yet again, this time by a biological attack, the worst bioterrorism attack in U.S. history. Uh, the, uh, someone sent anthrax through the mail to, to locations in Florida, Washington, and New York. Five people died, and 17 more were sickened. And for many months afterwards, millions of people were afraid to open their mail. The investigation of the 2001 anthrax attacks, according to the FBI, became the largest and most complex investigation in law enforcement history. This is a story about how a few scientists used DNA sequencing and some novel bioinformatics methods to, to uh, reveal one of the first critical breakthroughs in, in the investigation. So first, let me say a little bit about uh, anthrax. So anthrax is caused by the bacterium Bacillus anthracis. Um, it's a very common bacterium. It's found throughout the world in soil. It does not normally cause human illness. When we do see it as, uh, when do, we do see it infecting people, it usually causes uh, skin infections, most commonly seen in animal handlers. However, when it's, when it's uh, turned into powder, which it can be done, and inhaled, it causes inhalational anthrax, which can be very deadly. Um, it's also extremely heat resistant and desiccation resistant and forms spores that can, can, uh, re can live for many years. Um, and because of those properties, it's been considered to, uh, as a biowarfare agent uh, for uh, many decades and, in fact, was used uh, as long ago as World War I uh, as a biowarfare agent. So after the attacks, um, a question arose from the FBI, which was, could we use DNA sequencing to help trace the source of the bacteria? So at the time that this uh, happened, in 2001, I was at a place called TIGER, the Institute for Genomic Research, which... Um, for many years in the late 90s and early 2000s was the world's leading center for microbial genome sequencing. Uh, in fact, the first bacterial genome ever sequenced was sequenced at Tiger in 1995, uh, as was the second bacterium and, and, the, third, uh, and the third. So um, it was natural for the FBI to approach us and ask us, is there a way to use sequencing somehow to track down the source of the anthrax? This is a very unusual question at the time. DNA sequencing was, was moving along rapidly, but was still really in its infancy compared to where we are today. And there were comments made at the time, and this is from the FBI final report, the quote here, um, the test needed to conduct such an analysis of Bacillus anthracis did not even exist at the time uh, in 2001. It was, as one world-renowned expert later called it, Star Wars stuff. So there was a lot of skepticism about whether this would work. Um, so the, nonetheless, we, have, we, of course, took it on uh, uh, right away. So we were um, in the midst of sequencing anthrax at the time. It had not, the genome of anthrax had not been sequenced. We were sequencing um, a strain called Ames, Bacillus anthracis Ames. Uh, we weren't done yet. At the time, in the early 2000s, it took about a year, if you did everything right, to sequence the bacterial genome. And by the way, today it takes about a day. But back then it took about a year. It was a big project. Um, we weren't done yet, um, but we got uh, a sample of the anthrax from the first victim of the attacks, a photo editor named Bob Stevens, who was in, uh, from Florida, where one of the sources of, one of the targets of the attacks. Um, uh, so we got a sample of anthrax that was grown from, from him. Uh, we sequenced that as rapidly as possible over the course of two to three months, which was very fast then, and compared it to the not yet finished sequence of the Silicenthracis Ames that we were in the process of finishing. And we published those results in a paper in early 2002. Uh, and there we only found four single nucleotide differences between the chromosomes of these two uh, genomes, which are the same strain. Uh, the genome is about five and a half megabases, so four single base differences in five million base pairs is not very much. Um, but this, of course, doesn't tell you anything about where it came from. It just says, okay, it's, it's the AIM strain. Um, there's almost no, no difference between them. So there's much more to do. So the next step was to sequence um, anthrax collected from all the other um, sources of the attack. So the FBI collected uh, the letters that were sent to senators in uh, Washington and to news organizations in New York, and here's pictures of the envelopes here. Um, so there was powder in each of these envelopes. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, the FBI's microbiology team uh, grew up anthrax from each of the letters and gave that DNA to us for whole genome sequencing and assembly. And the idea was we would assemble all these genomes, compare them to each other, and see what other differences we might find, which we would, were hoping might turn into a signature that we could use somehow to, to sort of fingerprint these, um, these isolates. So um, a genome assembly is really what this is all about, but I'm not going to be able to, I don't have time to go into the details, but here in one slide is kind of a picture of what genome assembly is. So the idea is you, you have your genome represented as a line segment across the top. Um, to sequence it, you break it into millions of pieces. 
all very short fragments. And you do that because DNA sequencing can't read the whole genome end to end. It can only read a short distance along the genome, a few hundred base pairs. So you break it into millions of fragments randomly. You sequence all those fragments. And those are just sequences of ACs, Gs, and Ts, which I've shown here uh, with three little examples. Imagine those are the reads that we get from the sequencing pro process. And then we compare them to each other using sequence alignment algorithms and see how they overlap. So when the sequences match, and I've shown here these three sequences overlap one another very nicely, then we can say, okay, they probably came from the same location on the original chromosome, so we can stitch those together or assemble them. And if everything goes perfectly, then at the end you reconstruct the entire chromosome. But that's not usually how assembly ends up. Usually you end up with the genome in some number of pieces, more than one per chromosome. Um, and uh, that's called a draft assembly, and, and we have many such assemblies now. Uh, and if you have the resources, you can go and finish it using additional directed sequencing techniques to fill in the gaps that, are, that remain. So we did that for all the letters. We began doing that in 2002 and for a couple of years afterwards. And then the FBI, meanwhile, was doing uh, a great deal of microbiology work, and they discovered something very interesting in, in one of the letters, initially in the letter sent to Senator Patrick Leahy, um, and they called these morphotypes. They discovered that as they were growing up the anthrax from this powder, that the colonies, and here's pictures of them from our eventual report, which was only published a couple of years ago, um, that they had different shapes. The colonies on the slides where they were growing them had different shapes. So you see on the far left, there's what the wild-type colony looked like. And if you looked at it very closely, you see there were other, these other morphotypes where the colonies looked a little different. And the hypothesis was that, well, if it's got a different shape, then each of these colonies grows from a single cell. And the idea was that the hypothesis is that, well, there's some mutation in that cell that started that colony that made it have a different shape. Now, we don't know if that mutation had anything. We don't know when that mutation occurred, right? It might have occurred while you were growing it. Um, but because of the incredible importance of this investigation, the FBI said, well, let's just assume it was already there in the envelope, and it might be in somebody's lab, that same mutation. So let's take a little aliquot of each of these morphotypes and sequence the entire genome of those as well. So we did that too. So they found multiple morphotypes in, in several of these of the letters. So we undertook whole genome sequencing of all the letters and of all the morphotypes from all the letters. So we sequenced and we assembled and uh, put these draft assemblies together and eventually finished uh, quite a few of them that have filled in all the gaps. And the idea was once we'd done this complicated assembly process, um, we would then compare the genomes to each other and to the reference genome, which while this is going on, we, we finished the reference AIM strain and filled in all the gaps. Uh, and we would ask, oh, well, are they identical or not? And if they're not, any differences would then be, uh, would, could, could be used by the FBI to go and look for other isolates that had, that had the same mutations with the idea being that, that those might be um, the source of the male anthrax. So as we sort of expected, anthrax has a pretty low mutation rate. The worldwide population of anthrax genomes are very similar to each other. And many people were very skeptical at the time that we would find any differences at all. In fact, there were quotes in the New York Times saying this was all a big waste of money um, because we wouldn't find any differences. And there was a, a big question about whether sequencing was accurate enough. If there were so few differences, was sequencing even accurate enough to find them with, with high confidence? Um, and, and we were quite confident that, that, it, that uh, sequencing was accurate enough because when we do these genome sequencing projects, we sequence to a high level of redundancy. That is, at every location, we have multiple reads. Each read might have an error rate of 1%, but once you've seen the same position many times, your confidence in that, in that, in that position uh, gets very high. So we weren't really worried about that. But as we we're doing these comparisons, most of the genomes turn out to be very, very uh, similar uh, and sometimes identical. So we weren't finding very many differences. But here's the uh, one very critical puzzle that, that uh, I want to have you think about just for a few seconds that, that turned out to be uh, uh, the key breakthrough in the case. So we were looking at the assembly of the letter, uh, the morph A, the morphotype A from the, the letter sent to Senator Leahy. Um, and this is just a cartoon showing you a little stretch of it, um, comparing that to the, to the Ames, the reference Ames assembly. And so here I've shown uh, in a cartoon fashion the genome is a line segment in brown with two ribosomal RNA repeats in red. This genome has 11 ribosomal operons, each of them several thousand base pairs long, and they're all identical to one another. So those red pieces are, are long and identical repeats. And when we initially lined these two, they were identical. Um, but this morphotype looked different, right? It grew differently. So we thought there should be some difference. And normally, at the time, normally this would be kind of where it would stop. We'd say, well, we can't find any differences. Um, but we were puzzled that these were identical, because they shouldn't be. There should be some difference. Um, we, which we thought was genetic. So when we looked at the assembly more closely, um, they, they, we, 
every genome assembly that you do um, always has some reads that don't fit. So we get millions of reads these days. Back then, we would get, these are tens of thousands of reads. So by today's standards, it's not very big data sets. Um, but we always had some reads that didn't fit into the assembly because there's always some bad quality data when you do a big sequencing run, and we usually just ignored those. So for this project and for many projects since then, we decided we didn't really want to, we couldn't afford just to ignore the reads that were kind of left on the cutting room floor. So Mihai Pop, who was one of the other computational biologists working on this, discovered that he took all the, those reads that, that hadn't assembled and he aligned them back to the genome. And he found um, four reads, just four, that have this peculiar property. We call these chimeric reads. And um, this is, we do see occasional chimeric reads in, in a genome project. And a chimeric read just refers to a read where while you're preparing the DNA, two pieces of DNA accidentally stick together. And you sequence them and it looks like there's no way to map this read to the genome. It looks like it goes to two places. And you just assume, okay, well, that was a, a mistake. But we had these four chimeric reads that aligned in the way that I'm showing here, um, where the beginning of the read was in, a, um, was in a repetitive region and the end of the read was in a unique region. So the, the green part is from the ribosome learner to repeat, each of these four reads, and the blue part is in a unique region. But they're in the wrong orientation and they're right next to each other, as you can see here. Um, and there were four of them. If there had been just, just one, we would have probably dismissed it. But there were four of them and they all lined up with each other. So you could align them there, but then they would, only the blue part would align. Um, or you could try to align them to one of the copies of the ribosomal RNA, RNA repeat. The, green, the dark green part would align, but not the blue part. Or you can align them over here or any of the other ribosomal RNA repeats. So none of this worked. So this was a puzzle and we wanted to fix this. It was disturbing to us. Um, so I thought about this overnight at the time um, and, and came up with, with what turned out to be the, the right answer. Um, if you take that region of the genome that um, contains the blue and the green sequences and you cut it out and duplicate it, all right, so it's a two, it turned out to be just over 2,000 base pair intervals. So you can take that region, you can make two copies of it and concatenate them end to end. And if you do that, then all of the chimeric reads would align correctly. So this is what we hypothesized was the solution. It was a tandem duplication in the genome assembly program because it was an identical tandem duplication. The assembler had initially collapsed those two on top of each other. So the assembler had done the wrong thing. And this is a very common problem with assembly. This kind of tandem, exact tandem duplication is very difficult for genome assembly problems, programs to get correct. So, um, so that turned out to be the, the solution and, uh, and it was correct and we did multiple PCR validations to, to, to show that, in fact, that, uh, that morphotype from the lay letter did, in fact, have this 2,000 base pair duplication. And then we started looking very hard in the other, um, in the other isolates for the same kinds of phenomenon. And in the letter sent to Senator Daschle, we found a triplication of 822 bases uh, in a similar region, but not quite the same place. And in the letter sent to the New York Post, we found a 2,600 base pair duplication. So these three duplications, it turned out, were critical breakthroughs in the case, although we found these in 2002, 2003, and we didn't know for about five years that they were useful. So the FBI, meanwhile, was going around the country collecting uh, isolates from every lab they could identify that had ever received the AIMS strain. So the AIMS strain is housed at Fort Detrick, Maryland, and everybody who got it had to get it from Fort Detrick, Maryland. There were pretty good records. Today there would be even better records, but there were pretty good records about who had um, the AIMS strain in, uh, in any lab in the U.S. So they collected, in the end, over a thousand samples and screened them all for those three mutations plus the single nucleotide polymorphism that we also found. And that took several years to do. So we did all of our sequencing work and we kind of handed all this information to the FBI and then they, they, they went out and did the investigation. Um, and we didn't really find out much about what was happening. But in this uh, extensive screening, only eight samples tested positive out of these over a thousand samples. And even more telling, all eight samples came from the same source. They came from a flask called RMR1029 that was at Fort Detrick, Maryland. So that flask was, in our minds and the FBI's minds, undoubtedly the source of the mailed anthrax. So that flask had DNA from that flask had all four of these mutations, and no other of the thousands of, of the over a thousand samples had any of those mutations in it. So that flask was. Um, there's a picture of it right there. Um, it was Fort Detrick, Maryland, in a in a, secure, in, a, in a secure lab that was run by Bruce Ivins, who's pictured here, um, who's an anthrax, was an anthrax researcher, had been working on an anthrax vaccine, had been working on anthrax um, for many years at the US, uh, US Army Medical Research Institute for Infectious Diseases called USAMRID in Fort Detrick, Maryland. Um, he and a few people in his group were the only people who had access to this lab. It was a locked lab. So um, based on this, the FBI was very confident that Bruce Ivins 
uh, was, or, or perhaps someone in his lab uh, was the person who had sent out the anthrax, which uh, let me just sort of quickly um, digress a tiny bit. There was a tremendous interest in the letters themselves, and the FBI did many analyses of these, and you can read about it in their final report, which is all online. Here's a picture of one of the letters. Um, all the letters had 9-11 um, written on them. They were, they were these short messages in block letters. This one just says, this is next. Take penicillin now. Death to America. Death to Israel. Allah is great. So it is clearly intended to su suggest this came from a foreign source, not from a domestic source. Uh, and there's even a misspelling, a kind of critical misspelling of penicillin, which a microbiology researcher would never uh, would presumably never make. The FBI noticed, for example, on this letter, and there's an extensive discussion of this in the report, that some of the letters are bolder than others. And um, I'm just circling them here to emphasize this. They noticed there were a bunch of, there were nine letters here that seemed to have gone over twice. They were all A's and T's, and you could turn that into a code. And Bruce Ivins was known to be fascinated by codes, so they considered this to be additional, very circumstantial, but additional evidence that it was probably him. Um, and that code, if you then turned it into uh, amino acids would spell it FNY, which they regarded as, as a critical attack on New York. And their report said that he had a, that Ivans had a deep hatred for New York. Now, this is very circumstantial. <laughs> but this is the kind of analysis they did. They did this on in, everything they could. They didn't have a lot of physical evidence. So, um, but the genetic evidence was, was really overwhelming. So the case was closed in 2008. Um, unfortunately, so in August 2008, the FBI officials had a press conference, and they explained they were about to bring charges against Bruce Ivins. Uh, they told him they were about to indict him, so he knew this was about to happen, and unfortunately, he committed suicide. So this was never fully aired in court, so he never made any public state. Ivins never made any public statements about it, uh, and we'll never really know if it was him. There's no confession, but the genetic evidence was, in, in our view, incontrovertible that that flask at Fort Detrick was the source. Uh, in all this investigation, which they called a marathorax, uh, conducted more than 9,000 interviews and executed more than 70 searches and followed leads across six continents. And along the way, they said, this is from the final report, uh, a brand new science was developed that ultimately led to the big break in the case, which is what I just described. Um, the science creating a DNA equivalent of a fingerprint allowed investigators to pinpoint the origins of the anthrax. So today we call this microbial forensics. A lot of these techniques are pretty standard now, but in 2002 they were not. Uh, the most common use um, today, fortunately, is not for such a nefarious purpose, but to track down the source of infectious outbreaks that, that come from our, that appear in our food supply, which you read about fairly regularly these days. So let me stop there and just acknowledge um, the people who did this work with me back in 2002 and 2003, uh, particularly Mihai Popov, I already mentioned, and Martin Shumway. Um, we were the very small computational group who worked on all this analysis. And Jacques Ravel led the sequencing. He took over the project from Tim Reed, who led the original anthrax project. Uh, thanks for your attention. Yeah. I'm wondering how many researchers can list the Department of Justice as a funding source? <laughs> and, um, and what was it like, just from a practical point, working with the FBI to facilitate some of this work? So it was, it was, it was really interesting. Um, we did actually write this up in a paper in 2011. But until 2009, we were bound by confidential, legal confidentiality agreements. We weren't allowed to talk about this for many years afterwards. Um, the FBI had both investigators and scientists who worked with us. So there were a couple of scientific investigators who were just like us. They were interested in publishing this, and that's why we got that first paper published in 2002. But then after that, the, the investigative, uh, the special agents who worked on the case, they didn't want to, ta to say anything public because that's sort of their style. And they were certainly, they were very, very serious, and they had a lot of interesting concerns, it was very educational for us about, um, they were concerned, in fact, more than anything else about the chain of custody kinds of evidence, because they had um, recently gone through this big failure where they, uh, the OJ case was still fresh in their minds, the OJ Simpson case, where they had DNA evidence there, and the jury ended up being easily confused, as it turned out, by clever, uh, clever defense attorneys, and they said, we need to be very careful with all this DNA that we're collecting from all these different sources that we, we can document very precisely who had access to it. Uh, so it wasn't really, so in our mind, the scientific evidence was very clear, but the evidence about who actually had access to that flask at Fort Dietrich was beyond our purview. So we did learn that that was sort of their main concern. Okay, fine. Did the four mutations you were speaking about include the tandem repeats? Or just four the mutations included the three tandem repeats and one SNP. Those are the four.